the law. When Israel arrived at Mount Sinai, God declared, You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. When the Gentile nations encountered Israel, God intended for them to hear of him and join his covenant community. God created the law to distinguish his people and set them apart as holy. The law would guard Israel against pagan religious practices, protect the weak and vulnerable, and provide checks and balances for a flourishing society. Much of the law could be summed up in Leviticus 19.18b, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. God gave the law to the Israelites for their good and the common good of their neighbors, even foreigners. It both distinguished Israel and allowed for a healthy relationship with others, giving Israel a sense of faithful presence in the world. Next, we examine several law themes, love God, neighbor, and enemy, in a city on a hill, people. Love God. The Shema, a text the Israelites prayed twice daily, summarizes much of the law. The Shema says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. God called his people to love and worship him alone among a multitude of foreign idols. Self-described Bible nerd, Dr. Tim Mackey and co-founder of The Bible Project, says the Shema functioned both as the Jewish Pledge of Allegiance and a hymn of praise. In the New Testament, when the Pharisee asked Jesus which commandment is greatest, he answers with the Shema. But where Israel falls short of fulfilling the law, Jesus obeys it perfectly. Now through faith in Christ, Christians can love God as God intended in fulfillment of the law, even the Shema. True flourishing is dependent on knowing God, which is possible through knowing and loving Christ Jesus. In Revelation, Mackey explains how the author John contrasts God's name written on his people's foreheads, which follows the Shema, with the beast mark on all others' foreheads. He writes, you either give your allegiance to Jesus and allow it to influence how you see and act, or your allegiance will belong to destructive powers that will also govern how you see and what you do in life. One path leads to life, the other to death. To put anyone or anything above Jesus, whether a nation or political party, leads to destruction. Israel's law, therefore, has enormous social and political implications. Believers today face the same temptations the Israelites faced. Will believers love God first? or worship nations, political figures, or the economic security they offer. To do so is idolatry. Shess explains, While our relationship to chocolate chip cookies and football teams can certainly dishonor God, perhaps we've watered down the language of idolatry to the point where we miss the real idols. Political participation has a unique ability to inspire idolatry in people precisely because it so often involves promises of protection and provision, requires sacrifice, legitimizes authority, and inspires submission and worship. Joshua warns Israel when they entered the promised land that they will perish if they partner with foreign nations and marry pagans. The prophets also warned of Israel's allegiance the prophets also warned of Israel's alliances with other countries. Today, when the church binds itself to political parties and powers, it commits idolatry. The church must love God more than anything else, including political power. Love neighbor. Jesus affirmed that the greatest commandment is to love God, and the second is to love one's neighbor. God desires believers' love for him to extend outward to those around them. Jesus further defines the neighbor in the parable of the Good Samaritan. When a Jewish man is attacked by robbers and left for dead, both a priest and Levite, the religious elite, walk by on the far side of the road. They are public servants every Jew would have esteemed. Good Jews, however, thought of Samaritans as half-breeds because they refused to worship at the temple, only obeyed the Pentateuch, and were a semi-Semitic mixture. Yet the Samaritan draws near and touches the Jew in a very intimate and tender way, cleaning wounds and applying healing ointments. The Samaritan takes the Jew to an inn and pays for his health care and housing. 
Jesus seems to be encouraging his followers to get closer to the victimized and ostracized, to get proximate and embody his love in real life situations. Christians cannot only be nice to Samaritan type people from afar, but should build personal relationships and invest in their lives. Jesus gave his followers the Good Samaritan parable to stretch their imaginations of who their neighbors are. He expects his followers to put aside their social, cultural, religious, economic, and political biases to love their neighbors and show compassion to them, whether they are on the radical left or far right. This can be uncomfortable as it forces believers to admit their neighbors are those they might not usually affiliate with, their child's Muslim classmate and her family, the progressive gay couple a few doors down, the conspiracy theorist at the store. Jatani remarks, the most important thing is not what you decide inside the voting booth, but how you love your neighbors once you leave it. Like Moses went up the mountain of Sinai to receive the law, so Jesus went up on a mountain, sat down, and delivered a new law, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5-7. through Jesus' law fulfilled the law of Moses, is its culmination, and redefines it at a higher level. Where once the law said not to commit adultery, Jesus said that to lust after a woman is the same sin. Jesus identifies heart sin to be as wicked as sin acted out. In this new law, Jesus shows what it means to love God and love others. While only Jesus will do so perfectly, he expects Christians to try to obey what he taught on the Sermon on the Mount. When done, the church cultivates human flourishing as believers not only seek their good, but the common good of their neighbor. Love Enemy When God calls the Israelites to seek the shalom of the Babylonians, he is calling them to love their enemies. Jesus affirms the radical nature of shalom in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, b when he likewise says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. When others responded with violence and hate, Jesus tells his followers to respond with peace and love. Sprinkle remarks that Matthew 5, was like the John 3, 16 of the early church. He writes, a person who chose to love his or her enemies can have no enemies. That person is left with only neighbors. If a believer feels anger towards politicians or their voters, they can love them by praying for them. 1 Timothy 2, 1-2 through 2 says, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Believers can pray for their leaders' wisdom and flourishing as they also pray against their injustices. Scholar Dr. Christopher J. H. Wright writes, When it comes to wicked leaders, we pray for their repentance and salvation, but against their policies and practices. Believers do well to remember that the real battle is spiritual and not against people, politicians, or partisans. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. No matter what the political pundits say, a believer's actual battle is unseen. Unfortunately, many have aggrandized policy debates to the level of cosmic battles between heaven and hell. Instead, believers should worry less about politics and pray more for the salvation and transformation of all those involved. A City on a Hill In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus identifies his followers as a new and different kind of community. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Jesus intended for the Sermon on the Mount to function as a new law for his disciples, a transformative ethic to distinguish the church community and offer hope to the world. Jesus delivered the law on a mountaintop to show continuity between his words and Moses' law at Mount Sinai. Jesus is not merely connecting with Sinai, but further back to humankind's original state of flourishing in the garden. Genesis says a river flowed from Eden, suggesting a mountain-like setting. Ezekiel confirms, You were in Eden, the garden of God. You were on the holy mountain of God. Eden is the seed of a city on a hill. When the Holy Spirit helps Christians obey Christ's new ethic, they, 
Edenize the world, working to restore it to its original state of flourishing. Sprinkle remarks, Jesus therefore takes the law's incremental steps to the top of the mountain, and the mountaintop looks a lot like Eden. Isaiah 2.2 looks forward to Christ's return. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. In Revelation, John sees the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. God will dwell with his people in a place that has a mountaintop quality. The New Jerusalem will culminate in the city on the hill vision, fully realized in eternity. When believers live by the Sermon on the Mount ethic today, they recapture a little bit of Eden's flourishing and usher into the present age a little bit of eternity's flourishing, too. This beautiful vision stands in stark contrast to the way America has identified itself as a city on a hill. John Winthrop, the first governor of Massachusetts and a Puritan, was the first to identify their project as a city upon a hill. Since him, it has become a popular refrain among presidents and politicians to identify America as a city on a hill. But there is a problem. In the famous sermon titled A Model of Christian Charity, John Winthrop, its first governor, sketched a vision of the colony as a city upon a hill. The city was an earthly New Jerusalem dedicated to God and to obeying God's laws. Chief among the government's roles was enforcing those laws, including watching over the purity of religious observance. Flogging, mutilations such as cutting off ears or cutting out tongues, and in cases of adultery, idolatry, and blasphemy, execution were some of the punishments for disobedience. To identify any nation as a city on a hill and yet not operate with Jesus' new ethic is a perversion. To do so is not symbolic of Eden's mountaintop status, but is reminiscent of Israel's high places where the people worshipped false gods. No nation can embody Eden except for the church, which can only do so partially until Christ returns. Believers should not think of America as a city on a hill, as a new kind of Israel, or a Christian nation. America does not operate according to the Sermon on the Mount. It freely uses violence to further its power and control. True flourishing is only possible through believers loving God, neighbors, and enemies. Thank you for listening to this part of my Doctor of Ministry thesis paper. To watch the next video, click in the top left corner of the screen. And to see the whole playlist, click in the top right corner of the screen. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Take care.